when we were approached to put together this program, I have to say, I felt like a kid in a candy store. All the people that I read, I listen to, I think are some of the most thoughtful uh, colleagues. I was able to put them all together in a conversation. And we were able to whisk you away from your busy desks and your busy schedules for a very concentrated conversation about uh, the future of Europe, uh, what it will look like, how the United States uh, can be a part of that future. So I can't begin to tell you how privileged I feel to have you around this table and to begin a very important conversation. I think it's only fitting that we we open uh, the we open this conversation with, uh, in some ways, what brought us to this point of of reflection about the future of Europe, and that, of course, is the European economic crisis. So we're going to begin a conversation uh, of what we call a union's greatest challenges: Europe's future path toward economic growth, global competitiveness, and, of course, addressing the question of debt. Uh, as Professor Wood noted, that was a challenge for the early origins of, of the United States and certainly continues to be a challenge uh, for Europe today. I think uh, w the next uh, uh, conversation is going to be one of, of great importance. And I'm so delighted to welcome three colleagues to help kick us off intellectually. And I hope everyone around the table uh, will uh, participate. I have lots of questions marked down. I hope you have as well. We're going to begin um, uh, with David Marsh. Uh, David is chairman and co-founder of the Official Monetary and Financial Institutions Forum. That's a long title. Um, and uh, But David uh, is a senior advisor to, to many um, uh, asset management companies, investment banks. He's also, you'll note, we have a lot of influential Financial Times correspondents, current and former. And David uh, was uh, the uh, European editor for the Financial Times for both France and Germany uh, for many years. He has written some definitive books. I highly recommend The Euro, The Battle for the New Global Currency. I'm in the middle of it. It's a wonderful uh, book. And David, uh, we, we welcome you. After David concludes his opening remarks, we're then going to turn to Bob uh, Hormatz, who is vice chairman of Kissinger Associates. But uh, for many of us in Washington, uh, Bob was the undersecretary of State for Economic Growth, Energy, and the Environment. He's been uh, 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 an advisor on international economics to many presidents, many secretaries of state, and has a wonderful perspective from the United States about Europe. And Bob, we're so delighted that you could be with us. Thank you. And then, last but not least, we've asked Wolfgang Munchau to be what I call the closer on this panel, help summarize uh, the conversation. Uh, so many of us read Wolfgang's uh, very important uh, uh, columns in the Financial Times about the Euro crisis, speaking of writing very important books. Uh, Wolfgang has written uh, his latest book, The Meltdown Years, The Unfolding of the Global Economic Crisis, has won many awards. He's also co-founded uh, Eurointelligence.com, a website that is absolutely focused on uh, information and, and debate about economics in the Eurozone. As I said, this is a dream team of economics. So uh, without further ado, we'll, we'll start our panel panelists. Uh, after their opening remarks, I'm going to throw them a few questions just to get the ball rolling. And then if you would just turn your, your little tent, if it stands up upright, and then we'll get into a dialogue. And please, as we begin, introduce yourself. Hopefully by the end of the conversation of the forum, we won't have to introduce ourselves anymore. So with that, without further ado, David, tell us about the future of Europe's uh, economic growth, competitiveness, and debt. No, thank you very much, Heather. Th thank you for being so flattering and warm-hearted uh, in your opening. And uh, you've raised expectations, and let's see whether we can fulfill them. I, I don't want to go too widely into this, since I am just kicking off. So I thought it would be a good idea also to talk about where we've come from, as well as where we might be going. And I will talk mostly about the Euro, because after all, this is the flagship project that we have in Europe, and it deserves a bit of attention. So you could call my talk, where did it all go wrong? And that is a phrase that a waiter apparently did to George Best, the famous Northern Ireland footballer, when the waiter or the butler burst into a hotel room 
where George Best was lying in damask sheets with goblets of fine champagne, a couple of semi-naked ladies cavorting uh, 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 with curtains wrapped around them and so on. And this uh, waiter or this person who'd been brought in by room service, he said, George, where did it all go wrong? And the point about Europe is that there is a lot that has gone wrong, but Europe has become a great deal more interesting as a result of this. So I'm one that looks for a silver lining in, in these features. I, I do think it is very important that we are here in Williamsburg and we do have these historical memories to guide us, but rather echoing the thought that Gideon was putting, we have had nearly 250 years of history since then. An awful lot of things have happened in Europe and that is something which Europe should indeed have learnt from. It, my first couple of minutes therefore will be on what has happened and, and how did we get into this state a few uh, minutes on what is happening now, uh, and then a few minutes to conclude on where we might be going. I think that Europe did actually draw the wrong lessons from history. The point about the monetary union was that people had had bad experiences with fixing currencies in semi-fixed systems over the last 20, 30, 40 years, and so the powers that be simply said, we will just abolish all currencies. It's a little bit like going into hospital with a a bad toe, and the doctor said, well, we'll amputate the whole leg. That will get rid of the problem. And I do think it was a step too far. And, and where I would say that the Europeans went wrong was a, a monumental mixture of negligence, uh, arrogance, ignorance, incompetence. And every, apart from that, probably they did very well. But in, in, in terms of the actual history of the euro, it, it was monumentally reckless, I think to decide a system that was almost certain to have uh, banking failures. There was a lot of cross-border lending going on. There was almost certainly going to be states that were getting into difficulty because the single currency was really a recipe for countries to live beyond their means. And would, they would run down their competitiveness. They would heap up large deficits. The banks were almost certainly going to get into difficulties. And so it was, it was pretty reckless to go into that system without actually having mechanisms, firstly, for spotting what was going on, and secondly, to sorting things out when the problems arose. The, the, the banking union, which is now coming in uh, rather at a later stage, and I think is still very far from perfect and may well be delayed, sh those kind of thoughts should have been entertained much, much earlier. Uh, the European Central Bank, which in no ways is the worst offender, but I'll just single them out here because it's nice to have just one small scapegoat, the European Central Bank, because they realised that this wasn't uh, an optimal currency area, the point about the European Central Bank was that they just stopped looking at the individual statistics for the nation states. They now, to their credit, do admit that that was an error. They simply published the aggregate information as though all the individual nation states had disappeared. That was part of the plan, of course, that you should look at Europe as just one big happy family. Now, the inevitability of all this is that when countries do heap up debts and deficits, they do have to be repaid. And so what the Europeans didn't understand is that by getting rid of the currencies, you got rid of the possibility of a currency crisis, but you hadn't obviated the problem of a capital market and a debt crisis, which is what essentially has taken place. Now, where are we now? After five years of monumental cuts in demand, um, falls in demand of up to 20 to 25 per cent in some states. Greece is clearly the worst, but there's also been falls in demand from the peak of, say, 2008 to now of 8 per cent. We are now getting back on track in terms of just restoring some semblance of balance. Indeed, this is one of the paradoxes that Europe is now, the euro area is now recording a current account surplus of about 2 per cent of GDP born of the fact that domestic demand has been very heavily cut in many countries that previously had got into trouble. It's also a paradox because we talk about Europe's weakness because the euro is relatively strong. There's a lot of capital flight going on at the moment from the area of Russia and the Ukraine, and it certainly isn't going to go into the dollar. It is going into the next state most nearby. It's going into the euro area. The, the, the situation that we now have is that if those countries which have inevitably had to cut back demand, if they were now to rise up back to the growth levels of the past, they would almost automatically run into 
again, a problem of imbalances, because I don't think they're fundamentally competitive enough to cope with a return to the old levels of growth. Therefore, those states that have got themselves into trouble, they have continued within the euro. They've had to have these massive internal devaluations. They have forsaken growth. That's gone for good. The growth that's been forsaken in the last uh, five or six years will not come back again. And I think they are destined to go on a path of continued rather mediocre growth and always facing the difficulties that if growth were to go above a certain level, they would get back into the same old competitiveness problems again. In terms of where we are going, I, I do believe that is the future. I think the euro will limp on. It has not been uh, a great success. It's not been a complete failure either. One has to say technically it's worked uh, well enough. And of course, the whole mechanism that has taken place has been very much forecast in the past. The, the Bundesbank, which some of you may know, I follow with a, perhaps a too great a zeal sometimes, they, they did write all this down. This is a story where the script um, had already appeared. I, I think that the, the problem, the paradox that we face now is that from an economic point of view, you would need much greater centralization. You would need centralization of competence, both in order to decide the policies that nations should take, uh, and also to iron out some of the discrepancies in, say, tax or in finance between individual states, some of whom are doing much better than others. So you, from an economic point of view, centralization is the key. And this clearly does remind us of some of the American presidents that we were just heard about from, from Gordon. But from a political point of view, there is just not the stomach for this. There has been so much distrust and suspicion of an equal and opposite kind between the debtor states and the creditor states. Both are equally, but for different reasons, uh, suspicious, skeptical, um, downright annoyed about each other. The debtor states, because they feel that the creditors have been exerting demands which are far too exacting and far too ungenerous. The creditor states, because they feel that they have been bailing out or at least helping to guarantee the future of the debtor states without enough gratitude being shown. The German example is a good one. I'm looking forward to what Wolfgang has to say about that that when there are regularly Nazi slogans daubed on the walls of great uh, Athenian temples, or when Mrs. Merkel goes down there and is rewarded with uh, swastikas in the streets, this hardly really encourages the Germans to, to turn a blind eye and just bring more money. Um, and yet it's inevitable, I think, that all the problems of the past, the lack of German war reparations for terrible atrocities visited upon the Greek people, in the Second World War, all this comes back again, i.e. the very opposite of what Europe was supposed to bring about. Therefore, my prediction is that we will not have United States of Europe. Very interesting that Chancellor Cole came up talking about that in the 1980s, and therefore it's very nice that we're bringing this back now for the Williamsburg summit. Um, but I think the day of the United States of Europe has certainly gone. If the euro is to survive, and I'm not at all sure that it will, because I do think that the internal contradictions will certainly at some stage cause some countries to leave, but if it does survive, we will have to have some form of political union, but it won't be in the classic um, type of political union that the post-war thinkers and the post-war architects and the, the Gasperis and so on were thinking about. It'll be a, a totally sui generis. It can be summed up, I suppose, in three phrases, and of course we have had very much at the top of our minds the no taxation without representation. If you then throw in the, uh, the Leninist uh, slogan of uh, Vertrauen ist gut, Kontrolle ist besser, which is quite difficult to translate really, because it simply means that one mustn't trust people too far. But I was, years ago, I was given the prize of a book of Shakespeare, who after all we all know is a German poet, uh, for, uh, for translating that as, um, don't uh, feel sure, make sure, which I still think is a pretty good translation of Fatari's good control is better, but that actually does sum up why Mr. Weidmann, the, uh, the young, uh, rather eager looking, but really monumentally intelligent chap who's running the Bundesbank these days, uh, he's come up with this phrase of keine Haftung ohne Kontrolle, which is actually rather similar to the no taxation without representation, which means we're not gonna give you buggers any more money unless we can properly control you. 
And, and that, again, does bring us back very much to a paradox, and I will leave the, the conversation on this. The, the Germans clearly should be in charge of the whole thing and making the trains run on time and making the people pay their bills properly and making sure that all the exporters do their stuff. But the Germans don't actually want to be in charge of anything. They've given up on being in charge of anything. So we do have the, the great... Um, project of the euro, as I say, bored of a mixture of incompetence and, and negligence and a historically inevitable state of affairs that we've got into now. It, it is a wonderful conundrum. It makes Europe a hell of a lot more interesting place than if we were all aligned with each other. But basically, there is a hole in the heart of Europe and nobody really wants to run the place. We're waiting for the Americans to take over. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> David, thank you. You've great kicked segue. us off in great, uh, great fashion. Thank you so much. Bob, over to you. Well, that's a great introduction. The Americans should take over. Oh, um, that's a very uh, fitting introduction. The Americans should take over because the thing I wanted to talk about was not so much how the Americans could take over, but some of the key elements that I think are important in terms of transatlantic relations and in terms of strengthening Europe's competitive capability in this new global environment. And the two really mesh in ways that I will describe in a few moments. Uh, and I'd like to talk about four key parts of this overall equation. One is energy. A second is trade and investment, um, which I think is extremely important. A third is uh, labor market policies, proactive labor market policies in an environment where unemployment is extremely high in parts of Europe, particularly Southern Europe. And uh, the last, which relates to the third, which is small and medium-sized enterprises. Um, and the, two, the, the four of these interact in ways that I will describe, but in each one of them, there's an opportunity for Europe to strengthen its growth outlook, but also for the United States and Europe to establish a higher degree of solidarity and uh, mutual support in a very difficult environment when both uh, European uh, economies and the American economy are simply not performing in aggregate as well as they should, particularly in the area of job creation. Let me start with energy, because I think this has been a highly discussed topic of late, largely because of events in Ukraine. It had been a topic on the American-European agenda for a considerable period of time, not just the US and the EU. And I want to emphasize, Europe is not only the US and the EU, although there are a large number of European countries in the EU, but it involved a broader range of countries as well, including Turkey and some countries that were not in the European Union. The, the Ukraine crisis, in a way, should be a wake-up call because, first of all, there are new opportunities in the energy area for both the United States, which has taken advantage of new technologies, particularly hydrofracking, and horizontal drilling, both for natural gas and for various kinds of oil or tight oil that's found in shale, uh, which has given the United States an opportunity to do two things. One is to reduce its dependence on imported oil. We used to be at 60%, now at 40%, and dramatically reduce our dependence on natural gas, where today we import almost no natural gas, which has freed up Atari and other natural gas, which now goes into Western Europe and reduces the dependence of the Europeans on Gazprom and has given Europe a stronger negotiating hand on, uh, in negotiations with Russia on natural gas. But there's a bigger uh, topic ahead of us, and that is, first, on the American side, are we going to export more natural gas? It's a very slow process, which has involved individual decisions by both Department of Energy and what's called FERC, which is Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. You have to get permission of both. So far, only one permit has been given by both for one uh, natural gas or LNG exporting facility, which is in Louisiana. There are six that 
have been, are in various stages of approval, and there's something like 20 that are down the road, which will enable the U.S. to supply more natural gas to various parts of the world. But the fact is that the price of natural gas is higher in Asia than Europe, and therefore it's likely to attract a lot of that natural gas uh, onto the Asian market. Uh, oil, where the United States is not uh, a net exporter of oil, and it's not going to be for a considerable period of time, but there are parts of the country that should be able to, pr to produce and export oil, and the question of whether the United States will be able to do this remains to be seen, but the, it's becoming more supportive, the environment's becoming more supportive. The reason I mention it is because it gives the United States a new uh, diplomatic and geoeconomic opportunity to engage with Europe as a, an exporter of, of energy, um, which can, to a degree, reduce Europe's dependence on natural gas and oil from Russia. But the other side of the coin uh, is that Europe itself has been missing enormous opportunities to do the kind of things in the energy sector that the United States has been doing, which is to say, and I won't mention countries because it's quite clear who they are, there is one big country that has given up nuclear power, um, which means that it either has to import more gas from, uh, from, the, from its east or uh, import more coal from the west, the United States, which from an environmental point of view is not the, not the fuel of choice. And then there are other uh, countries that have, in effect, decided they're not going to engage in fracking and hydrofracking because they have environmental problems. So what's needed here, I think, uh, without going into great detail, is a much more strategic dialogue between the United States and Europe on how to do two things. One, utilize energy to reinvigorate growth, and it certainly had a positive effect in the United States on, in, in that area, but also to figure out ways in which the heavy dependence, still heavy dependence, and for the foreseeable future, heavy dependence on Russian gas and oil uh, will remain if something is not done about it. So perhaps the Ukraine crisis can be a wake-up call for a greater degree of cohesion in the energy sector and a greater degree of strategic planning. Added to that, there are these pipelines that are being built across southern Europe, the Trans-Aegean pipeline is a pipeline that goes uh, and taking Central Asian gas and oil into Turkey and then um, taking it by ship to other parts of Europe. This uh, is, I think, one area where the U.S. and Europe have an opportunity. If we wake up and sort of overcome some of the um, psychological uh, impediments to a more robust domestic set of energy policies and a greater degree of cooperation can be very useful in boosting growth and uh, in both Europe and, and the U.S and boosting cohesion between the two and solidarity between the two in this economically and strategically important area. Second, TTIP, Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. This, to me, is a huge opportunity for both uh, the U.S. and, in this case, the EU, which is the negotiating partner, to do something that it has found very difficult to do for decades, and that is to come to some agreement that reduces barriers. And the barriers are not necessarily tariffs. The average tariff is about 3 or 4 percent across the Atlantic. But to reduce regulatory barriers and standards differences in, in standard setting. And the, one can go into great detail on this, which I will spare you a discussion of. But the fact is, if there ever were a moment when uh, the heads of state and government of the United States and Europe should increase the level of prioritization for TTIP and give it high-level, full-throated political support to overcome bureaucratic and regulatory impediments and wrangling among negotiators, this is that moment. There could be no more important medium term. It's not going to benefit either side right away, but medium term strategic signal to our own people and to uh, Russia and others of solidarity between the U.S. and Europe than to uh, push forward in a much more purposeful and uh, an expeditious way progress on TTIP. Uh, it would create a lot of jobs on both sides. And in as much as NATO 
to the average young European and the average young American who don't really understand the origins of NATO, to the extent that NATO is not as strong a glue between the United States and Europe today as it has been in the past. This can demonstrate to the American on Main Street or the Frenchman in La France Profonde, this can demonstrate a certain amount of benefit on both sides to the transatlantic relationship economically and undergird uh, stronger security relations between the, uh, between the U.S. and Europe. The third uh, point r relates to proactive labor market policies. Here, if you look at unemployment, it is uh, an enormous problem, and it is, even if, even if the uh, aggregate economies are beginning to improve in certain parts of Europe, and they, and they are in many parts, if you look at the numbers and, and, and uh, trade surpluses of countries that had trade deficits, current account surpluses, but the unemployment problem is still very substantial. And there's some countries in Europe that have, and I would say Germany is certainly one of them, and the UK, for reasons that I'll mention in a moment, um, is another. There are, uh, there's a need to figure out ways of addressing uh, labor market issues in a more proactive way. Germany has a number of things, and the Germans here will be able to describe these far better than I, but uh, Kurzarbeit is uh, extremely useful. We don't have anything like that. Apprenticeship programs, we have nothing like that. There are a whole range of things that are, I think, very important where we could learn uh, on our side of the Atlantic and Europeans on their side from countries that have done this and done this quite successfully over a period of time. But I'm afraid if you simply leave labor market policies to, uh, to cyclical uh, changes, you'll be waiting a very long time because um, I think uh, you know, David's made the point that it's going to be very difficult to get really rapid growth in any of these countries, particularly Southern Europe, in any foreseeable future. But if you wait that long to have growth um, and you don't do something much more proactive about the high level un of unemployment, then, the, then the, the, the issue that could adversely affect Europe and the euro is not just the numbers, not just the e economics, but very serious social problems. Uh, which will be blamed on the euro or lack of sufficient cooperation within Europe. So uh, it seems to me that preserving uh, the, the unity of Europe and the cohesion of Europe in part is, in, in large part, is going, to be, is going to be dependent on how to deal with this massive unemployment, particularly unemployment on younger people, and particularly in the southern part of the, of the continent and a pro set of proactive policies, again, is important within Europe and also on the transatlantic side because we don't have a very a proactive set of labor policies either, and therefore finding ways of addressing youth unemployment here, which is becoming also these income inequalities and issues of mobility or lack of mobility is a, a growing social problem in this country as well. And the last point, uh, which relates to the, the one I've just made, um, relates to particularly the issue of small, medium-sized enterprises, which I think in a, in a very real sense is, a, is one of the critical dimensions of, um, of the U.S. and the European jobs problem. But also it has to do with, with the question of, of inequity. Um, and let me just describe it from an American point of view, but it's probably not too different from uh, the European point of view. One of the reasons you have such bitterness in this country um, about the last several years, which includes the, includes the uh, Tea Party people and others, is that the, the big bailout which was for which taxpayers' money was utilized um, which includes TARP and includes the stimulus program, large banks and large companies got large sums of money. Um, and they have, for the most part, paid it back, and the government's made some money on this, for the most part, not in every case. Uh, but the average person who runs a small company is saying to himself or herself, I got nothing out of this. And for them, credit markets still have not come back, and it's still extremely difficult for them to get funds 
to increase uh, opportunities for their companies. Raising money for your small, medium-sized enterprise is very difficult. And this heightens the, 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 uh, the imbalances in the country, and it leads to an enormous amount of bitterness between Main Street American companies that can't get money and financial institutions and other big companies that have gotten money, large sums of money, and now can pretty well go out and pay bonuses and do the kind of things they were doing, living pretty high on the hog, while mainstream America continues to suffer. And I think that is very corrosive of our democracy and creates lots of social divisions. And in the end, I think, is going to also undermine our foreign policy, because a lot of people who feel this way are going to say, why should we be doing things abroad? Why should we be supporting international programs or globalization, when globalization, in our view, harms workers and doesn't really benefit small companies. Big companies, big banks benefit small companies and individuals who are not able to participate or sort of marginalized don't. So it's going to have a, a major set of implications. And I think in Europe, again, for the same set of reasons that it um, undermines unity within countries if they see one group of people doing very well or one country or a couple of countries doing very well and the average person not. And if you look at the interest rate, for instance, in Greece, 10% if you're a small business, if you can borrow at all, you get 10%, 11% money. If you're in Frankfurt or Hamburg, you can get money at 3 3 3.5%. So it leads to, it exacerbates already substantial competitive differences, and it, it leads to very substantial divisions between the, the opportunities in Southern Europe and the opportunities in Northern, Northern Europe. So some type, I know Europe's going through its banking reforms, and I think they're very important, and perhaps banking reforms have to take place first, but as a very high priority, uh, a lot more work needs to be done internally in Europe on strengthening uh, the ability of small, medium-sized enterprises to get money on the basis of some degree of equity between North and South, which means some type of European-wide institution or support plan, I think, is of the highest degree of urgency, because if it continues this way, the imbalances will widen, the competitive disadvantages of South versus North will widen, and the support for a, a, a harmony or a single currency is going to become even more tenuous than it is today. Thank you. Bob, thank you so much. They were great points to highlight. Wolfgang, over to you. Heather, thank you very much. I'm happy. Thank you for the invitation, and also thank you for the opportunity to act as the closure, uh, to close this debate, as you, as you, as you put it. Um, I want to pick up from, from, um, from David's uh, comment, and also link in with some of uh, uh, Bob's uh, uh, comments. But if I look at the, at the Eurozone crisis or the, at the uh, events of the last uh, three years, what had gone wrong fundamentally is a, a, monitor, is, is a fixed exchange rate system of different and non-converging countries is not sustainable. That is basically what happened. Now, not sustainable, as Herb Stein, President Nixon's economic advisor, once famously put it, you know, something that isn't sustainable will end, will stop. Uh, there is another way, of course, which is it can be rendered sustainable. And essentially, that is what this debate is about. And a lot of the pro-Europeans, myself included, made the mistake in the beginning, not in the beginning of the crisis, but at the beginning of the euro, that we thought, yes, the crisis will come. There's a famous comment by Romano Prodi, who said, oh, this is all going to end in tears. But it's actually quite a good thing, because when it ends in tears, you know, then we'll finally, you know, then we'll finally have the political union to actually fix it. And I think that was the mistake, because it ended in tears, and when the European Council met to actually consider those issues of political union, economic union, fiscal union. They decided not to do this. So essentially, this rendering it sustainable in the way that we had all envisaged didn't happen. For me, the crucial period in, in the way I think about the euro happened between June 2012 and December 2012. In June 2012, the markets were very pessimistic about the eurozone. The spreads were widening. Um, it was sort of at the time when people were really actively batting against the system. It was the period when I was, relatively speaking, most optimistic because it was the time when the European Council, including Germany, 
accepted a progression, a long-term progression towards the three goals of fiscal, uh, economic, and political union, including banking union. That was sort of subsumed in, 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 in all, of, all of that. Uh, it was a long-term plan. The president of the European Council was charged to draw up plans, and there were actually some blueprints that were, were, later came out that were quite ambitious. In some respects, even went further than what I, what I sort of had advocated in the years before. It was actually quite sort of there. There was a, a brief attempt. The crisis got worse uh, on markets, and that was the moment when Mario Draghi's launched his, uh, his you know, whatever it takes promise, his OMT of uh, or outright monetary transactions program. And that was the, the signal to the markets, okay, there is now a lender of last resort, we stop to panic. And the, the, the spreads went down. So this ended a part of the crisis, which was the most visible part, which was the sovereign debt crisis, the, the explosion of, of sovereign yields that made it very difficult for governments to refinance their, uh, their large uh, volumes of debt that were obviously the result of building up of, of imbalances that had arisen with the euro, as David uh, had, 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 had explained in, 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 in much greater detail. But there was a side effect to the OMT program, and this was, a, I think, a catastrophic side effect, which is that the political will to enter into this monetary political union, it ended. It was, it was visible pretty much in the weeks after, after he launched this program. It was then that um, the opposition to fiscal union became much fiercer in Germany. It was in, in September of that year. He had spoken about the program first in July, and, and was it, I think, in early August, and later uh, substantiated it in September. It was in the same month that Merkel definitely ruled out eurobonds, not just for now, but pretty much forever. It's over the next months the opposition became tougher towards uh, fiscal union as a principal goal. Uh, political union was too, you know, they were in favor, but there were no concrete proposals. But it was decided at the December summit to dump all, all the progress reports and all those meetings that were being, you know, that were being scheduled on fiscal union. So that important, that important um, uh, element uh, of further integration sort of ended because the crisis seemed to have ended, the pressure was off. Um, and it was for me the moment when what one could render sustainable, it was the more, it, we passed sort of a point of no return in, this, in, in, in the Eurozone crisis. You know, my prediction is not that it will collapse. I don't think the Euro will collapse. There will be a Euro uh, of similar countries, you know, Germany, the Netherlands, Austria, France had, um, Austria, Germany had had a fixed exchange rate since the 70s. Germany and France had essentially fixed exchange rates since the mid 1980s. They will continue to be able to have a fixed exchange rate system in a highly imperfect economic system without transfers, without fiscal union. That is not necessary. But Germany and Italy, it, it, it's, you know, Italy is a very instructive example. We don't even need to speak about Greece, where you know, the cat catastrophe of this, of this thing is most, most, most apparent, and everybody knows the country has been in recession for six years, still, still falling uh, with, no, with no turnaround in sight. But Italy is an interesting example. Italy, over the period of 1950 to the late 1990s, had a very stable rate of nominal growth. That's real growth plus inflation. You, you add the two together. So if, if you look at the nominal trend line of Italy, it was very stable in those, in those 30, 40 years. Once it entered the Eurozone, that line totally flattened. Um, Italy is now, depending on how you calculate it, between, if you look at that old long term, this is not sort of like some bubble trend. We're not talking about like 2005, 2007 kind of trends. We're talking really long, long term trends that are very stable for most countries. Italy is about 20, 30% below that trend. There is no way that Italy will catch up with that trend. That is clear. It cannot, it cannot happen. It would need a, a, a rate of growth. Um, with, a, with a debt level of 130, approaching 135% of GDP, a growth rate that has essentially been around zero, between zero and 1%, and Italy is not sustainable in the, in the, in the Eurozone. So the question is, how can that be? How can that be? How can that be solved? Can we just miraculously get back the growth? Very hard to see how, 
how Italy, the, the state, cannot cannot do it, be given the constraints. It's not even austerity. I mean, Italy is, is still running deficits of 2.6, between 2.6 and 3 percent of GDP. So this is not real austerity. These are simple, simple fiscal constraints. Italy has exhausted its fiscal potential, and, and there isn't really a lot more that the country can do. We're talking small decimal points. Even the debate today with the new government is about two or three decimal points of GDP. It's very hard to see, and to get a supply side shock is is very difficult. And here, here's the, my my point of disagree, probably the only disagreement we have on this panel. Um, my disagreement with, with with Bob: the the supply side reforms. You know, they've they've done really. You know, small countries have done really well, but we've seen no evidence that you can address a macro, a fundamental macroeconomic imbalance through labor market and structural reforms. You know, these things, even if the you take the greatest advocates of structural reform, like the OECD, and you know you don't get you know more optimistic about the the impact of structural reform than the OECD. And they did the numbers on Italy, and they looked at like what what's the accumulated impact over 10, 10 years, and ten years, you know this was like the maximum package, and we know you know in in real political life you never get the maximum package. You know, it's about six percentage points. It's a cumulated thing. I mean, you know, given what Italy has lost, I mean, you, know, you would probably take the 6% rather than not take the 6%, and I think they would be useful. But to, to repair an imbalance that has a, a macroeconomic imbalance that has arisen, has arisen uh, of that scale requires essentially what Italy always did. And the reason Italy maintained this relatively positive growth rates in the 50s and 90s was, until the 90s, was that the country devalued pretty much every five to 10 years there was a devaluation shock, and so it continued. Italy didn't have that. To, to have rendered Italy sustainable in the Eurozone, it would have taken a, a conversion towards German, you know, it's not just German labor markets, it's also pricing policies of companies, it's how to do business, it's how to organize your social, you know, your social, your social life, you know, these are so many factors that 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 are interacting. That's probably also the deep reasons why you know a country, a small country like Ireland, you know, can probably achieve an internal, an, an internal adjustment, a real adjustment. You know, it's a smaller country where you know it's not much that much that much to to leave. A large country like like Italy, but 50, 20 times as large, you know, with, with 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 structures that have grown for 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 very long periods. It's very hard to get the Italian trade union system made compatible with that of another country. In fact, it would be completely impossible if Germany was in that position and had to be made compatible with, a, with another country. It's a completely unthinkable that this is, this is possible, which is now the, the, the real life in an asymmetric monetary union with, with Germany being at the core and everyone has to adjust, uh, has to, adjust to that particular uh, model, not because Germany is is um, you know, wielding power, but it's simply because it is sitting there as the as the as the largest uh, as the largest dominant dominant part of the system of, the, of an asymmetric system um, in in the middle. So my prognosis for the eurozone is that the the the, the system holds together uh, in the core countries. Um, that of the periphery countries. The small and flexible ones will be able to to maintain their membership. I see I see no reason for Ireland not to maintain its membership of the euro, as long as Ireland wants it and there is a, a general will. You know, smaller countries like Estonia should have no problems remaining a member of the of the eurozone. You know, for countries like Slovakia, I think it probably is all right. There's too many close links to Austria and. And others, um, I can see the Czech Republic and Poland at one point entering the, the eurozone. So you can see even enlargement of it to certain 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 countries. But I find it hard to see how Southern Europe is going to remain uh, a member of the eurozone, even with the best will, without the establishment of very significant transfers, without the realization of debt forgiveness. Uh, and debt restructuring, uh, in other words, without a large debt conference that would have to take place in a few years' time. Uh, and these are policy options that have been explicitly ruled out by, uh, by certainly by Germany, but also by the other, other northern, northern countries. So, so, here's, so something will have to give of those, of those two. Um, 
the, the there has been a strategy, and this has sort of been, been the Merkel strategy to say, okay, we don't forgive debt in any explicit way, but we do it through you know, extending loans, reducing interest rates, and obviously if you take that to some, both to you know, the extension to infinite and the interest rate to zero, then obviously that is debt forgiveness by, by definition. Unfortunately, it doesn't work quite like that, and the amounts that you forgive will not be sufficient to bring down that debt and, and actually reduce the uncertainty of default, which is what holds back investment. No one is going to invest in, into Greece un until and unless that uncertainty is taken away. So these political solutions where you, know, where you, say th where you do things but not say them and not admit them, where you have a sort of a smoke screen uh, in, front of, in front of you, you know, they, don't, they don't really work economically, and this is what we're, seeing, what we're seeing in Greece. So I see Greece, I see large parts of southern Europe, including Spain, where I see a debt, an unresolved debt problem despite reports of an economic recovery, which I doubt. In the case of Spain, I have, I have my, my great doubts about it. Um, I have my doubts about numbers, about published statistics. Um, uh, I'm, I just don't buy the story of a Spanish, of a Spanish economic recovery. But we're seeing a, 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 a private sector debt overload that is so massive that I find it hard to see how that can be resolved in any, in any, in any, in any smooth function. So from any strategic point of view, yes, the East-West division in Europe is, is, uh, is certainly ended, but we might see other divisions coming, coming, coming up, and I think the North-South division is, 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 is would be my main, main, main scenario. Wonderful. Well, thank you to all three for giving us such great content uh, and some good food for thought. I'd like to just throw out a couple of questions, and then I hope everyone's writing down, putting their tents up, and then we will we will get uh, moving here for the discussion. I have to say, I, I agree. I've been surprised as an analyst um, that muddling through has been achieved thus far, the sustainability of, of, of this. Um, but I, I think in many ways, the political leaders underestimate or don't understand the economic market pressures, and markets and economics don't quite understand the political dimension of the European integration project. So both are sort of colliding here. I have three questions for the uh, for three panelists. Uh, what is the greatest risk to the system? I think, Wolfgang, you really talked about Italy, and I know we'll have a conversation about that. I would probably add France to that list, where you have the larger economies that politically are not going to be uh, given the demands uh, to, to reform unless there's political will to do that. But what is the greatest risk to the system that we can see in the future? Um, I'd welcome that. We haven't talked, we've talked about the Euro and the 18 uh, members, but we have not only the North-South division, but we have the 18 versus the 10, those who are inside the Eurozone uh, and are, are developing Perhaps they're not the measures we need, David, but at least they're, they're focusing on integration. But the 10 are not part of that conversation. How do you sustain a union when 18 are moving in one direction, 10 may or may not move in that direction? How do you, how do you look at that? And um, uh, you touched, Bob, on the unemployment. Here's my societal question. So we have an incredible youth unemployment problem, particularly in Southern Europe. But in 10 to 15 years, we have a demographic problem in Europe, particularly for Germany. By 2050, an elderly uh, growing population without the sustainability. How does the economic model of Europe look where you have really a lost generation that if this continues, we're going to have a skill set loss of a young generation that if they, uh, they're going to, they've already left Europe if they can. Some that can't or are, are losing skills, and we have an older population that uh, will grow uh, on the fiscal budget. So those three simple questions, why don't we tease those out, and then I'd love to uh, get the thoughts from, from our participants. So I'm just going to work our way down. David, Bob, and then Wolfgang, we'll let you have the last word. OK, so you'd like us to answer a cocktail of a all cocktail. those yes. questions. Yes. Well, just listening to this, this is why one comes to these debates. I've just coined a new acronym based on this intertwining uh, irritation, because it, it strikes me that what held the uh, 
Cold War world together stopped it from imploding, as everybody knows, mutually assured destruction. So the acronym that comes to my mind here, and I do want to place a patent on this, just in case anybody, uh, just in case anybody really thinks it's worth copying, is is it's ma basically is is mutually assured resentment. That that is the essential binding tool. And, it, and this is actually quite strong because, of course, it does go back to all the wars that have been fought. There is still clearly a very strong political feeling in Germany that's got to go one step further to basically make up for being something of a bully in the past. And this political feeling does go quite a long way. And I think answering your question about what is the biggest risk, the, the risk would be that this political feeling of responsibility, I wouldn't say guilt, but it's responsibility, it somehow dissipates as a result of generational change, or indeed as a result of the resentment, which is there in a dull way, spilling over into the feeling that one is really ruling out. And of course, as many German economists say, the German taxpayer actually hasn't spent any money yet, because it's all in guarantees. Well, they will now. Um, Wolfgang talked very rightly about the need for a debtors' conference. Interestingly, people like Helmut Schmidt talk about the need for a debtor conference, and he is old enough now and statesmanlike enough and deaf enough to say all sorts of things that ordinary politicians, ordinary mortals don't say. And he says the debtors' conference will be necessary, and that's when the German taxpayer will start to pay. And so you won't have hospitals built, you won't have roads built, you won't have swimming pools, you won't have canals, all the things Germany does need, because you'll be shoring up the debt elsewhere. As we all know, there's a limit to what you can do with Greece in terms of cutting the interest rates. People talk about you know, the pretend and extend. Um, you could, of course, transfer all those loans into perpetuity. Uh, that might be going a bit too far, but that would be actually writing off big time. That would mean, actually, you wouldn't be gaining money uh, through the fiscal uh, system, which would otherwise be going on schools and hospitals and uh, swimming pools. The, 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 the Greek interest rate was already pretty low. I think the Greek, uh, the, although they've got a debt of 170% of GDP, the interest rate um, side of that is still only 3.5% of GDP. So even if they were to cut all the interest rate to zero, they'd only save 3.5%. And as Wolfgang and others know, the, the, the fact that growth is still very, very low in Greece means that from a, a, a enumerated denominator point of view, the, the debt to GDP is getting worse all the time, despite the huge efforts that they have made. So that, that's my answer number one. If, if this responsibility factor or the political cement binding together um, were to fail. I agree with Wolfgang, by the way, the business about crises driving Europe to ever greater heights. Uh, that Monet description has now come to the limit of its usefulness. I think it was actually Padua Schioppa who said in an article in the FT, I'm not sure whether it was 4D, I think it was more Padua Schioppa who, who said, now the crisis has come and at last it will claim rightfully the prize of political union, which has always been rightfully within Europe's grasp. And as you very, very nicely pointed out, um, that probably is the clue why Mrs. Merkel, without um, actually talking to Draghi, and I do know that, um, she did alight on the OMT and gave it her full support because she thought, oh, well, Draghi's managed to sidestep that one for me. You know, thank you very much, Mr. Draghi. And that does actually lead to a lot of resentment at the ECB because they do, exactly as Wolfgang says, they do feel that they've done too much, which is why they're doing too little in, in the last 12 months. In terms of the 10, now, obviously, I do stick up very much for the countries outside as the non-Euro club because as John Major might say, this is a not inconsiderable bunch of, of, of countries. And then if you add in those who are not even in the EU, like, say, Switzerland or uh, Norway, and you could throw in, say, the Turks uh, uh, as well. These are all countries that Germany is doing a hell of a lot of business with. It, uh, these, it's not just the 10, it's also the other 17 countries or so of Europe, including Russia. Um, Germany is doing progressively more trade with all those countries. Germany does as, almost as much trade now with the non-European countries, sorry, with the non-EMU countries, which are in Europe, um, as it does with the EMU countries. It does about 37% of its trade with the EMU countries. It does about 32% of its trade with th those 10 plus those other important European countries that are not in the, in the EU. 
Um, so I think that is, one has to pay attention to those 10. I, I'm pretty doubtful whether Poland will join. Or Poland wants to join, clearly, for all kinds of geopolitical reasons, but it does know it will be trapping itself into, uh, it'll be the hammer and the anvil that has always been Poland's tragedy, only in a different way this time, economically rather than politically. They want to keep the door ajar. So I think that's going to be a huge test for European statesmanship, um, how to keep that show on the road of, indeed, as, as you said, Heather, making sure that there's a, a modicum of political integration amongst the 17 or the 18, um, and somehow keeping the show on the road with the other 10. The other 10 are becoming increasingly important. I will stop at those two questions and leave the floor to others. Okay, thank you. Bob. Um, on the first one, I think the, the, the greatest vulnerability is the unemployment issue um, for a wide range of reasons. One, because if one talks about discontent or resentment, uh, there is no greater source of discontent or resentment than countries with large numbers of unemployed, particularly unemployed youth who can't get jobs and uh, therefore find the frustration level rising, not simply against their own governments, which is palpable in at least some parts of the region, but against Europe for either constraining their governments because they don't have the freedom to maneuver their currencies or let their currencies float as in the past, or other countries are not, in their view, in the eyes of these people, giving them sufficient sums of money to help overcome the problem or asking a higher level of austerity than they feel comfortable with. But it is a source of enormous resentment, and I think it is, uh, if one has to pick one major source of, of uh, instability or potential instability or vulnerability, that would be it. Um, this leads me to the second question, and that relates to uh, the cyclical structural discussion that uh, we were, I think, perhaps have a, a difference in perception on or diff differences of, uh, in, in terms of the notion of what, what works to address some of these problems. I think that the reason, uh, I'm, uh, first of all, I'm a great believer that if you can get growth, that is a very good thing, and that will be perhaps, not perhaps, but would be the single most important way of overcoming a number of problems in Europe and overcoming uh, the unemployment issue that a number of these countries face, as in the case of the United States. On the other hand, there are two factors that require, I think, a more nuanced approach to this, because we in the United States have seen the economy begin to pick up, but in this recovery, relative to past recoveries, employment has not picked up at the same pace as growth. In other words, we've seen more growth um, relative to increases in employment than in the past. So employment is lagging historically what one would normally uh, expect given the fact the American economy is growing, not growing in a dramatically strong way, but picking up. And therefore, there are structural issues that have impeded the recovery of unemployment at a pace one would anticipate given the growth of the, uh, of the American economy. Uh, so there are structural issues that exist. They're not a substitute for growth, but growth in itself is not a panacea either. The other side of the, uh, of the coin is that in some parts of Europe, if you would conclude, as I think many of us have, that growth is not going to be very robust for a period of time for a lot of the reasons that were mentioned on this panel, then there need to be, um, not as a substitute for growth, and I'm not arguing there should be a substitute for growth, but if you don't have growth, you need to find some things that either achieve a higher rate of growth than currently anticipated, and I would put a better energy policy in that category. I would put uh, TTIP in that category, and I would put uh, providing ways of financing small and medium-sized enterprises 
um, in, uh, in a more effective um, fashion in that category, and to a degree proactive labor market reform, although I accept the fact that it's hard to create growth only with labor market reform, but it can be, it can be helpful in some areas if one increases training and if one increases uh, education, it does improve the productivity of the workforce and therefore can help to improve the overall environment. I point out that if you look at northern, northern Africa, Egypt, with huge amounts of labor market discontent, had for a period of time, as did Tunisia, growth rates in the 4, 5, and 6 percent. But a lot of people, even though that growth occurred, a lot of people didn't benefit from it. So there is an, an interrelationship between the two. And I don't think one can simply say, we need growth. We do need growth, but there are a lot of structural issues that need to be uh, addressed as well to enable more people to benefit from growth. And if you don't have growth, then to find ways of ameliorating at least some of the, of the, uh, of the social tensions that arise from a high level of, of unemployment. So this would be the, the, the issue that I would, uh, would focus on. And I think that there are, you know, economists can debate this endlessly, but the longer people are unemployed, particularly young people are unemployed, the more it will affect the ability of the economy to grow. So um, a cyclical problem becomes a structural problem. If you can't get your first job, you don't get job, job training, then you're less employable, and the ability of your economy to produce at a high rate of productivity is diminished because labor, labor doesn't have the training or the experience to do well. And um, to, uh, to Heather's point, which I think is a very good one, if these economies age because of demographics, if your population is going to stay the same or be flat uh, or, or diminish, uh, you to achieve the very same growth rate, you need a higher level of worker productivity. So that you, you need, in, in the, given the demographics of the United States and most countries in the Western world, you need to increase the rate of productivity of the workforce to maintain the same growth rate if you're having, if you expect over a period of time, as most large uh, industrialized countries do, a diminishing workforce as the baby boomers retire. So growth and structural issues are not uh, separate. They're part of the same overall whole, and we have to look at them that way. Okay. Yeah, on, the, on your question of, um, I mean, I, I talked about what's, what's going to be. I, I disagree with you on France. I'm, the, one, the one country I'm less worried about is France. I know that, in, in, especially in the UK, uh, there is a lot of, you know, I think it was the 75% tax rate that kind of triggered everything. I mean, I, it kind of probably led to political discontent among the elites, uh, you know, the people we're talking to, you know, people who read the Financial Times, and, you know, that, that I can imagine that there is a, you know, exactly sort of the, the kind of people the financial press talks to and that we, we worry about. But as an economic event, it isn't, it isn't, it hasn't been, a, it hasn't been, it hasn't been, it hasn't been that bad. France has a slightly higher level of debt to GDP than Germany, it's about 10 percentage points. It's not that big a deal. France has a much better growth performances uh, in the Eurozone than Germany, uh, much, much better uh, since, since the start of the Eurozone. Germany has covered, has done relatively better lately uh, but the overall, the overall performance is not, is not, uh, is not. France is clearly sustainable in the eurozone. I, I have no, no question. They have to do a few reforms. I agree, not necessarily the ones everyone mentions. I think that they need to do some. I think they need to do something about this, the labor market contract, the single, the the high, the high, the relatively high youth unemployment. Not so much for economic reasons, merely for social reasons. They need to. They need. To, this is an important domestic political issue. Uh, it would. It would. Um, uh, you know. It would render. You know. The economic performance more, more sustainable in the long run. But I do not see France as in any way in danger here. On the 18 versus the 10, it's not quite as simple. From the 18, obviously, you have the ins and the possible outs. And, but of the 10, you have the pre-ins and the outs. So this is a quite a sort of, we're grouping into like four here. Mm -hmm. And of the, of the 10, only the UK is a definite out in the sense uh, of out forever. Uh, the Danes are not saying out forever. The Danes are saying out for now. The Swedes are saying out for now. 
So while I wouldn't classify them as pre-ins either, they are sort of in a sort of, um, sort of on the cloud. The UK is different, and that's why we're having this UK debate, because the UK has decided it doesn't want to join the euro. It will not join. It's not just an opt-out, but it's definitely a decision not to get in. There is nobody uh, I know of in the UK who really wants to relaunch the euro, let's join the euro debate. So, so that's basically, um, and that's why we are having this debate uh, in the UK about does it make, is it sustainable for a non-member state of the Eurozone to remain uh, a prosperous member of the EU? I'm sure we have plenty of, it would take us away from our subject here today, but this is, a, I think this is one of the most important uh, debates and obviously also central to Francois's book. Um, uh, and and yeah, this, is, this, is a, this is a hugely important uh, uh, debate uh, on which one could have two different views. Now on Germany, what is happening there, and I think you, are, you, you made a very important point. Um, uh, Germany has chronic low investment, which is, you know, Germans has an 8% current account surplus, which it invests, sort of like Germany invests abroad instead of at home. You're seeing under, under, under investment in infrastructure, decrepit roads, you know, canals, and that, and a, and a nation society. So this is, you know, Germany is turning into a rentier society that is working off its savings. That's you know that's sort of the the, the uh, you know the, the current account plus surplus will then shrink, <laughs> shrivel away over long periods of time. They will they will persist, for now, shrivel away, and then you know they they hope to have amassed enough enough savings in order to um, to live to to make this. I don't think this is a very happy or sustainable position, but just as the. The, the energy the, the energy policy shift from nuclear to coal, basically what it is now, is a particularly sustainable uh, uh, shift either. But but um, you know I think there's a lot of hypocrisy in that. So yeah. there we are. Great. All right. Let the questions begin. I'd like to take two at a time. So let's start with Francois Heisborg, and then we'll go with Arrigo Sadun, and then I'll take the next set of two. Please. Francois. Uh, thank, you, thank you very much. I, I can't resist having just listened to the very last point which Wolfgang made about, uh, substitute, uh, about the coal uh, policy of Germany. Uh, in France, in, Par in pa Paris, but not only in Paris, we've had the, the worst pollution we've ever had. And the specialists say about 50% of this is due to particulates. Uh, blown in by the wind from Germany. Uh, so, uh, 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 you know, kein, kein, Kraft, kein, kein Atom, uh, danke sehr. Uh, uh, no, seriously, uh, a question to Wolfgang and to David, and I won't talk about my book, I'll have the opportunity to do that in a couple of days. Uh, 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 there's one point upon which I think just about everybody is in agreement, at least I've never heard the counter-argument, if there is one, and that is that the Eurozone is not an optimal monetary area. But the, and, the, and here comes the question, have we moved closer to creating an optimal monetary area uh, since the creation of the Euro in its banking role in 1998, and a fortiori since the beginning of the crisis, uh, strides forward or not in the field of labor mobility. Uh, uh, the uh, renationalization of the various, uh, of the financial industry in Europe. Mm. And are we moving forward or backwards mm. in terms of creating an optimal monetary area? A, a couple of quickies for, for, for Bob. Uh, uh, TTIP, I couldn't agree more with you, what you said, but if your president doesn't think that this is important enough to work the hill the way a president is supposed to work the hill to get fast-track authority, nobody in Europe is going to believe that this is going to happen. Uh, and it's not as if we had massive resistance against TTIP in Europe. We actually don't. It's, uh, it's remarkably subdued until now. Uh, so please, please get your president to act like LBJ, even if he doesn't look like LBJ. Uh, energy, here, energy here again. Energy here again. Uh, I, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, A, this should be the central topic of a US-EU summit 
you know, we've always been looking for serious things to discuss between the US, the US and the European Union. The time has come for this one precisely because of what's happened in the States with the energy revolution and what's happening with the Russians. But it's not only the Russians. When I look at the sources of gas for my country, for France, uh, Algeria, oh, very stable. I'm, uh, you know, no problem in the next 20 years in Algeria, I'm sure. Libya. Uh, Libya for the Italians. Uh, Qatar, our great, oh, this marvelous place, uh, Qatar. It's not only Russia. In other words, uh, there, uh, I, I would like to see a hard-headed discussion between the Americans and the Europeans along the lines. We, the Americans, we're going to open up the floodgates for the free movement of gas and tight oil and whatever vis-a-vis uh, -vis the world market, the opening up uh, on the one hand, but you, the Europeans, you'd better start pulling up your breeches uh, on, on your side. That's a remark, that's not a question. Thank you, Francois. Arrigo. Thank you, Ethel. And first of all, let me thank you <clears throat> very much for this wonderful opportunity to have the benefits of listening to so much uh, um, stimulating input. Uh, I'm particularly grateful because this is one of the very rare occasion that I have to express my own view. After being constrained for more than eight years as a, as a board member of the IMF, uh, I cannot tell you how much I relish <laughs> this opportunity. <laughs> the only um, constraints I have now are my own uh, personal limitations, and I, I, I ask your forgiveness for this in advance. Let me just touch uh, very briefly three uh, topics which have been raised. Um, Euro, of course, uh, the austerity measure. Um, I cannot say nothing about Italy for no other reason that uh, I'm Italian, and perhaps uh, an overall conclusion. On the euro, has just been uh, reminded us uh, by my, the previous uh, speaker that uh, the euro is certainly not an optimal currency area. But we have to be careful what that means. An optimal currency area could work if uh, not only the monetary construction is perfect, something which is obviously the euro was not. But even taken as the imperfection of the monetary construction, as an economic entity, it could work if the other elements which surround the monetary constructions functions. In other words, with all the imperfection of the construction of the euro, the system it could work if the other economic factors, meaning a kind of mobility of factors, which is the theory says is necessary to make the optimum currency work, but also the elimination of the gap in the performances among these countries work. That is what really it's, it did not happen. And as a matter of fact, the launching of the euro, instead of being the beginning of a process of uh, bringing all these separate economy, economies uh, together, there's been an excuses and an alibi to abuse the system. And that is not surprises that at a certain point that collapse. Um, having said that, uh, I'm not as pessimistic, although I'm a trained economist, uh, to conclude that there is no future of the euro, not even as in a reduced form a euro limited only to a selected number of countries. But that, that's, I will leave it as, as said. On the austerity policy, and uh, that is a topic that uh, I feel very, very personally because at the IMF, uh, in addition to representing Italy, I also represented uh, Greece and Portugal <laughs> throughout uh, these uh, uh, stabilization programs. So I saw um, all the mistakes, errors, but also some of the success that these programs uh, have brought. And uh, very synthetically, 
I think I could say that uh, the type of uh, extreme austerity which has been imposed to these countries in order to first to stabilize the situation and hopefully to create the basis for the future growth has not necessarily been the optimum policy, but to some extent, and I would say by a large extent, uh, is working. At least we have extremely encouraging sign that that type of approach uh, is working. Austerity would not be forever, even in these countries. As a matter of fact, with the exception of Greece, all the other countries, one way or the other, are close to come out of this type of programs. And you have to keep in mind that uh, the slow growth to which uh, the program countries has experienced the last few years is not a unique experience of only the, these countries. It's a much more generalized phenomena. Almost all advanced countries, and not just the advanced countries, are going through a period of relatively slow growth, including the United States, Canada, and so on and so forth. There are very specific reasons for this type of phenomena. I don't have the time to um, go in depth that. Italy, I wish I would be as optimistic as Mr. Munchau on Italy. Uh -oh. <laughs> when I discussed the Italian situation to some of my clients, now I'm in the private sector and I, I do that for a living, I start to tell them that uh, the fiscal issues is the least of the economic problem of the country. The least. And as a matter of fact, uh, it's not just uh, a boutade. If you really look and you divide it, the fiscal situation between the deficit and the, the debt, you see not only that uh, the country has one of the lowest deficit, but even more fundamentally, the underlying long-term trend which uh, allowed the country to bring, to keep the deficit under control are much more positive in Italy than in almost any other advanced countries. The problem is, of course, is the debt, which is a secular problem. And the only way to cure the debt is growth, which brings me to another point. Why, why I say that fiscal is the least of the economic problem? Because the number one economic problem of the country is the slow growth. And that is not a recent phenomenon. It's not due to the entrance or the establishment uh, of the euro. Uh, Mr. Munchau has reminded us that uh, Italy has been able to sustain some decent rate of growth because periodically it was devaluating the country. But that is the problem. The country has taken before the euro the so-called easy way out without addressing the fundamental underlying problem. That's the reason why I say that it's not the fiscal, it's not the economy. The country needs very deep and radical changes in its own institutions. Mm -hmm. And uh, even without going into the purely political field, it needs a radical changes in those institutions which are necessary to make an advanced economy working. You know, if the fiscal system it doesn't work, if the educational system doesn't work, if the bureaucracy is suffocating, and if the cost of the politics is uh, exorbitant, uh, you could have the most uh, endowed countries and uh, the strongest entrepreneurial uh, spirit of the country, but that's it's not enough. Um, finally. Maybe, and that is uh, a point that I'm offering for discussion, I think we should probably come to re-examine the fundamental strategy which has been followed for the unification of Europe. You know, we start at the very beginning on the assumption that if we go through economic integration, that inevitably will lead to 
a really political unification at United States of Europe. Uh, that is not necessarily so. I mean, I'm not saying that uh, economic integration is not good for itself. I'm not saying that it cannot facilitate and bring tremendous advantage. But I think that is not necessarily the only way to go to move forward on that. And some other elements here are probably necessary, either on the social policy or on the policy in general terms. Thank you. Um, with the panel's forgiveness, I think because we have so many more and I want to keep us on time, I'd like to bundle all the comments and questions and then I'll let you at the end to do rapid fire response, if that's okay. I want to go to Liam Fox and then I want to go to Ivaldo Kaflin, please. Yeah, thanks, Heather. Just uh, very briefly, to echo Francois's point, one of the few things that actually unifies politicians in Europe at the moment is uh, an utter disbelief about the lack of willingness of the American administration to fight for TTIP. Mm -hmm. Caving in to domestic political pressure on the, pressure on the Hill it has just horrified us. And if the administration is incapable of giving leadership on foreign and security policy, we might have expected that they would have done something uh, on an issue that actually might make Americans wealthier, um, mm -hmm. which was TTIP. But my real question really is to Wolfgang, and I completely agree that um, it, it's logical, I think, that at some point uh, there needs to be uh, a way out of the euro for Italy, probably for Greece, probably for Spain and Portugal. They, it's difficult to see that they'll sustain the political and social pain uh, of having, in Spain's case, 58% youth unemployment. It's a crime in any case to inflict that upon a country. How? There is no treaty or legal mechanism by which countries can leave the euro. It was designed so that no one would ever find an exit. How is this going to happen? And given that that's the case, is not continuing to progress with things like banking union at the present time, adding insult to injury, and making a very difficult situation potentially much worse. Thank you. Evado, please come on. Thank you, Heather. Uh, I also would like to focus on the Euro question, although, uh, uh, of course, the economic development of Europe is much beyond the Euro and uh, very much uh, how Europe stays into the world, including uh, the, the transatlantic relations. But going back to the, uh, to the Euro, um, of course, uh, now we are very critical to the Euro, but it had some 10 years of very positive development before that. Uh, and we kind of uh, forget that. Uh, of course, if we can imagine now a situation where there was no euro, then what would happen with uh, uh, Greece, uh, Portugal, Spain? They would devalue their currency. Uh, if there is a devaluation of the currency, which is uh, the classical reaction to, to, to macroeconomic imbalances, then what would happen then uh, to the, for example, German export or German investments in these countries? Let's not forget that before the, the, the crisis in, German, in, in Greece, the German banks had an exposure of 90 billion euro to, 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 to Greece. And this is the same Greece that is criticized afterwards by Chancellor Merkel of not being reformed, being too uh, bureaucratic, et cetera, et cetera. 90 billion uh, German banks' investment there. If you had a devaluation, then that would be a huge blow to the German economy to take one of those. So do you think that fiscal transfers don't have any explanation. They are a counterbalance, indeed. Nobody wants to transfer taxpayers' money. But on the other hand, you have quite a lot of benefits from the, from the single currency, also going to some very large economies. Um, and of course, this is not just an economic question. No? This is not a zero-sum game, because you have plenty of political considerations with, uh, with the influence of decision-making, etc., etc. Second, talking about the geography of the euro. Uh, it's, uh, I'm not sure that this is a division between North and South now. I, I, I hardly imagine to have uh, uh, Spain, uh, Italy uh, out of the Euro and have Poland and Estonia in. Uh, what's the rationale for that? Is it economic or it's political? Or can you speak, if uh, we speak about different geographies, if you're about uh, Germany and German-influenced countries, countries around? But this is not anymore an uh, optimal currency area. And I'm not sure that we have to go back to Mandel to, to, to speak about the uh, optimum currency area, because there are some other additional uh, issues that, uh, that maybe we have to put in Europe. And, and finally, uh, a reflection that uh, it was really very interesting and stimulating to listen to Professor Wood before that. 
Um, indeed, uh, there is the post-war uh, moods make people unified. Unifying, it happened in Europe after the Second World War also. But the post-crisis moods are disunif disunifying. Uh, and uh, uh, so what is the reason for that? Do you think that it was easier after the Second World War to put together countries that have been fighting before that? And now it's much more difficult to put the European citizens together for something which, yes, they will have some pain. I'm speaking about political union, but there will be a result of that. What I think lacks is very much European leadership for that. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take Ulrike and then Antonio and then John. We'll have you finish up. Yeah, thank you very much. First, I'd like to thank uh, to Mr. Homard for just saying this little sentence that this uh, uh, bailout of the U.S. government basically bailed out or gave a lot of money to big American firms and to big American banks. And rightly, I think the U.S. citizens are upset about these things. And I just wanted to say that in Europe, this is pretty much the same, and European citizens are also upset about these things. So my my question here, sort of in the whole context of the rationale, who stays in, who gets out of the euro, is pretty much when do we, as these elite people sitting around tables like this, will acknowledge that these people we call populists are actually right in their analysis, that there's something going profoundly wrong. And um, and I think the, 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 we will be talking tomorrow about this sort of where's the democracy problem here. I think there is a, pro uh, a democracy problem here. And as TTIP has been mentioned, I think we should to put TTIP into this equation because the risk that TTIP basically, that the aggregated wells, if there is much aggregated wells out of this uh, uh, agreement to come, that this wells is again not evenly distributed among the citizens, huh? and not in the US and not in Europe neither. Uh, so not going too much into details here, but I'm very, uh, thankful to Ivali, who basically raised the same question that I had, and especially to Wolfgang. I take your analysis about the convergence factor and sort of if there is a day one after a crash, then po potentially the Eurogroup may look pretty much the same as it is with, you know, less south and more east, huh? in a way. That's an economic rational or an economic logic. The thing is that politics is not rational and politics is not logic. And just to remember that in the first place, the whole endeavor of monetary union by 90 wasn't logic. It was Helmut Kohl, Delors, and Mitterrand's emotions. And then you can read the thousand pages of Helmut Kohl's uh, biography written by uh, Hans-Peter Schwarz, who tells you that story. If politics is rational, we would probably be living in the skies of, uh, uh, you know, uh, heaven. The, the problem we are dealing with all over the time is that politics is profoundly irrational, and people like us do have problems to admit this. Yeah? And so the moment I take uh, Wolfgang's uh, mapping of the new Eurozone, then I look at the following question. And the following question is, the question has been posed, how do we make this sort of Italy needs to go out, that's the logical rational here, and Greece needs to go. Even if I had the solution in terms of treaty and so on and so forth. Germany, that's the argument, would lose a lot of money because it would, Italy would probably not pay back its debt, right? I mean, a country which is devaluating. So Germany or the Bundesbank sits on the Italian debt and on the Greek debt anyway. Why then these countries can't stay in? And why can't we then do a debt memorandum rather than hanging around with uh, half a million treaties to disentangle our debt portfolios from Italian to Greek to German sort of banks, uh, enriching half a dozen of uh, law firms in the United States and Wall Street probably, rather than just saying, look, get over it. And I think or I bet or I hope that this will be political rational which will provide at this moment. Thank you. Uh, let me reply to the nice uh, provocations of the, uh, the EU or the Euro being uh, arrogant, uh, ignorant, uh, negligent, incompetent, uh, recklessness. This one's for you, David. <laughs> so uh, just to start, I mean, many of the issues that, uh, of the optimal currency area, of the, in, I mean, the, the need for addressing uh, uh, shock absorbing mechanisms uh, was already discussed at the beginning. Uh, but it was, it was clear that the costs were, clear, were, were short, short term, the political costs of addressing these issues were short term and clear. And the benefits of uh, uh, not doing, uh, or the, the costs of not doing, or the, the risks of not doing uh, uh, the right thing uh, were considered too far in the sky. So the decision was made to, to move into the house, even if the house was half built. 
uh, with the idea that uh, it will be completed while living in. Mm -hmm. But soon after the, uh, moving into the house, uh, the priorities had to change because the house had to be enlarged. Mm -hmm. uh, the enlargement meant that m much of the uh, energy that has, had to be developed to, to complete in the house was devoted to, uh, uh, to enlarge it. So uh, it, was, uh, it was not antici anticipated at the time, sure, that uh, there could be a, a perfect storm that could unsettle the house. And this is what, what, what happened. And it was partly the consequence of, uh, of incompetence, uh, of uh, negligence, uh, but it, also, it was also part uh, the consequence of this perfect storm that could hardly be anticipated. So after, after that, there is a process uh, to both complete the house and fight the, and, and fight the storm at the same time. And this partly explains the, uh, the, non, uh, or the, the poor performance of growth in, in the uh, euro area. But uh, uh, a process is on to, to, to find the right balance between uh, between mitigation, so between, uh, let's say, creditor countries not extending a blank check, and at the same time uh, to, to, to have the shock, shock absorbing mechanisms that had been considered but not put into place. And this is a process that, uh, true, uh, is, is done in a lot of, with a lot of acrimony that, that the crisis has created. But it's going on. And what uh, I find hard, hard to understand is uh, that uh, the, the likelihood of finding a solution is dismissed from the outset. And I think there are proofs that, uh, that this is going on. On the one hand, uh, the countries that, uh, that had more, more need to, uh, to, to make the reforms, uh, they, are, they are implementing it. Uh, three years ago or five years ago, one could have never thought of uh, countries like, uh, like Spain or, or Italy or even Greece uh, undergoing the reforms that they have done. Secondly, uh, you said that uh, uh, the, uh, the shock, shock absorbing mechanisms or mutualization is out of, out of the question because Germany has said that, uh, it, that they don't accept it. I think, uh, well, that some, some statements go in that direction, but others go in, in a different direction, which is, OK, uh, if there are sufficient reforms. And, and this process is, is what's going on. Uh, there is a solution. It, it will take time, as I said. It's done in, in a lot of uh, within agree, agreement, which uh, makes it more difficult. But it's uh, what you call muddle, muddling through, but uh, that has, has an end. It, it will be through s small steps to reassure uh, both sides, but it's going on. So uh, I don't have the, uh, such a pessimistic uh, uh, forecast as uh, others have. Thanks, Antonio. John, you want to finish us up here? Um. This has been as good a discussion as I hoped it would be, so thank you first for all that. But there is another way of looking at this, which hardly anyone has written about. Uh, the SPD was fiddling with it a little bit and gave it up. And that is what I might call, for sake of a lack of a better word, a kinder and gentler Germany. I mean, the, every single bit of arguing, including here today about this issue, is based on the fact that Germany has demanded that everybody in the EU become German. And I think that's not going to happen. Um, there would be other ways. There would have been other ways of handling it. Right at the very beginning, Wolfgang, you know this, in 2010, uh, Schäuble himself wanted to set up a European IMF to funnel capital into these countries. He was killed in about a week by uh, Angela Merkel who took a look at, the, she called Mr. Cowder or somebody like that and said, this won't work, and it was dead. The EU has billions of wasted money every year in subsidies, in making sure that cucumbers are straight, all that sort of stuff, which could easily have been reprogrammed into other kinds of programs, either infrastructure programs or even debt relief programs. In other words, what I'm getting at is, if Germany really cares about Europe, which is a, open to question these days. If Germany really cares about the euro surviving, there could have been another way of doing it. Now, why wasn't there? Because they're afraid of their voters? Because they never told their voters the truth about the euro? Because they didn't have enough fantasy to think up another way of doing it? There is, not every state in the United States is exactly a productive center. 
but they get sort of helped along by the income tax system and things like that. There are various ways of doing it, and I'd be very grateful, especially you, Wolfgang, or the others also. First, do you think there would have been another way of doing it? And if that's true, what do you think this says about <laughs> Germany's future as a, as a leading country in Europe? Well, you all have not failed to disappoint. What an incredible uh, conversation. Each of the panelists have about two minutes to fire away at whatever they'd like to fire away at, because we have to move on. But what I want to assure you um, is that this is the beginning of a conversation that's going to carry over for the next several days, that all of these issues we're going to talk through in all these different panels. So I promise you this is not your last bite at this particular apple, uh, but we do want to be uh, very clear. So Wolfgang, I'm going to start with you, and we'll move down the line, and you literally do have two minutes to respond, but there's going to be lots of coffee breaks and lots of conversation where you will continue your, your response. Wolfgang. I hope to answer all of them, but I won't. Uh, so, uh, we will talk about Italy, definitely, uh, uh, but not now. Um, uh, I, I'd like to focus on a couple of the fundamental questions. Ulrike, your point about politics versus economics. It was politics that got the euro going. When something is economically unsustainable, even politics cannot, uh, it can make it sustainable, but it, it cannot. It cannot fix something, or it cannot just keep it together in, in spite of it being unsustainable. That's something politics cannot do. We've, we've, had, we've had enough experience of monetary unions and fixed exchange rate systems that failed, ultimately, even though there was political will. What politics would have to do now, what is the equivalent of what she called it in the early 90s, would actually to make it sustainable. But that isn't happening. That just isn't happening. And therefore, that's why, why I come to that conclusion. It is a political analysis. It's not, a, it's not an economic analysis. There is no economic inevitability of its failure. Not at all. Um, and um, the perfect storm argument, I completely disagree with. Schäuble made the point that uh, if it hadn't, the real, the deep cause of the Eurozone crisis was Lehman Brothers. If it hadn't been for the Americans, we wouldn't be in this mess. Amen. Right? So, uh, you know, you can always make the thing. This is an unsustainable monetary union. It, you know, that was the trigger. It would have been triggered by something else. You know, we've had financial flows which were unsustainable coming from the core to the periphery. You know, this thing, this thing were, was about to blow up. Whether it was, a, this is not a perfect storm. This thing was unsustainable. It blew up, just as economic theories would have told you that it would blow up. So there is nothing, there, there's nothing sort of like, oh, we've been very unlucky uh, uh, about this. It's just that we've been kind of ignoring this for 10 years. We've been kind of complacent about it for 10 years, uh, why, we are, why we are in this, in this, in, in, in this situation. On the, um, on the um, um, optimal currency area, you answered the question. We've moved away from it. There was an interesting point Joseph Stieglitz has made, and I think there's something one would need to explore, who said that if you took the sum total of economic performance of the Eurozone, we are probably now worse off relative to if you hadn't done it. I think that is an argument that I haven't heard made before. That it is sort of in sort of in sort of an aggregate. We're always looking at relative growth rates. We actually have to talk about stocks, about actual, you know, where are we? What where are we relative to where we would have been? The question is, have we sort of gone gone over a point where it's where we could actually say, you know, at this point we would probably not have been as bad off if we hadn't done the Europe. That's an interesting question. I don't have the answer, but I think that's something sort of some of the calculations economists will make uh, in the coming years. Wow, you did great. So let me just concentrate on two things, one on uh, exports by Germany uh, and then the other one on the OCA. And I, I, it's completely wrong to say that this was an irrational construct. Uh, part of the reason was indeed to protect German exports. One of the reasons why the German manufacturers want to, this to continue is because not just the intra-European trade would, would suffer. As has been pointed out, Germany would export less to Greece, but it doesn't export very much to Greece anyway. But the, the euro would be much higher on the foreign exchange markets, which would have a big knock-on effect on Germany's exports overall. Um, you only have to go back into the archives and look at all the documents about why the EMS got going in the 1970s. It was all about German exports. And this is a very, very important point. Um, then let me just. I was really pleased that um, Francois brought up this uh, optimal currency area because everybody knows really that OCA, and I just watched this film coming over here, 
Um, it stands for the Osage County area. <laughs> and, and some of you may have seen the film. Uh, I think it's an absolutely brilliant film. I was talking about it at lunchtime, actually. Um, I mean, you've got everything there. You've got drug abuse, you've got alcohol, you've got incest, you've got unlawful marriage, you've got all sorts of abuse and deviant behaviour. It's very much a synonym for monetary union. And, and also, just to bring up what Liam was saying about uh, how do you end it all, well, Sam Shepard, who's one of the starring roles, he just goes off and kills himself, but, you know, quite early on. Um, obviously, I'm being a little bit whimsical here, but this is why you invite the British to your conferences. Um, Meryl Streep, she clearly is, is the Germany in all this, because all the family go off and leave her, and she's just sitting at home with her pills. And that is, clearly, that would be the outcome. This is why the Germans desperately want the whole thing to be kept going. It's for fear of being left alone. So it, uh, I do think that Meryl Streep should be given an Oscar together with Mario Draghi, for, because they're both equally good performers. Now, just going to the serious point, if I may, um, I, I would also say that it's become less of an optimal currency area. Uh, Germany should have an optimal currency area with people that are not in the euro area. It would be far more optimal. Um, because of all the trade reasons I've, I've spoken about, there is obviously a greater degree of labour mobility amongst the right kind of labourers. I happen to know quite well the personnel director of BMW. She's actually Spanish. They are hiring a lot of very talented Spanish engineers. And my worry, and this echoes the point that Bob has made, that those uh, engineers will leave their country, go and live in Germany, learn German, become very much settled down there. As we all know, Germany does have labour shortages. This will introduce this hysteresis effect in Spain, which will make the whole thing a lot worse. I really do help. I do, I do hope that those very skilled labourers that are going to Germany now to fill in very highly qualified jobs, that that does reverse. So we've got a little bit of extra labour mobility in the right places for the right people, not for the masses. But as has been pointed out, this is balkanisation or renationalisation of the financial industry, that's very much the opposite of what was intended. If you again go back into the literature, read what Jean-Claude uh, Trichet, may his name be praised, uh, said about all this, he said that there will be a financial channel opening up in, uh, in Europe because we're not an optimal currency area. This is why there has to be a lot of cross-border bank lending, which is indeed exactly what happened, including into the bond markets, as was pointed out, the, the massive uh, imbalances that were built up. The German banks pointed out did lend the Greeks a lot of money, not just to buy tanks. And now all that has gone into reverse. Uh, and I think that is another reason why this thing does look un unsustainable over the longer term, without massive fiscal transfers, which will not just be debt, there will be grants. Uh, this money will have to be written off, which is why I say at, at the end all the German taxpayers have been heaping up that one trillion um, worth of, of, uh, of claims that have to be settled um, will just not get the money back, which will be tough, because as Wolfgang points out, this is a rentier state, and the whole point about a rentier state is that you expect the rent to actually be paid. If it doesn't, that could lead to a lot of worry and a lot of hardship and a lot of politicians being out of work. Thank you. Oh, let there be an op-ed in the future that Germany is Meryl Streep. OK, Bob, you get to finish up. OK. A few quick points. One, uh, Ulrich's point, I think, on the populist narrative is something that I think is going to continue to grow if people sense these inequities growing. And I do think that that is a vulnerability. It'll be intergenerational, it'll be intra country, intra country, and inter uh, country as well. And I think that is, if we're looking at sort of fundamental weaknesses that could undermine. Uh, not just the Euro and Europe, but really weakened support for democracy in some countries. I think that's a problem. And also very divisive in the United States. And it, for, for the United States, it, it's easy not to think about it or to characterize certain groups as extremist. And there are some very extreme points of view about this, uh, about this notion of inequity or the system being unfair. Uh, but the fact is that for large numbers of people, they see politics as sort of an inside game, that certain people, by virtue of their influence and their power, benefit from certain programs and others don't, and large number of people are sort of marginalized uh, as a result of government policies which don't really benefit them. And if unemployment, uh, particularly youth unemployment, continues 
at these levels or it gets worse or even just only gets a little bit better. I think these problems increase in their intensity. Specific, two specific points, one TTIP. I totally agree that if you look at the history of the United States, no major trade agreement has worked unless it has the full-throated and consistent ongoing support of the president. And the president's going to have to utilize his political capital, and admittedly doesn't have a lot of political capital these days, but whatever he has, he has to do it. And not just because it's good internationally, which I believe it is for all the reasons that I mentioned, but because it's particularly important in terms of American growth to expand opportunities in other markets. Even though Europe's not a rapidly growing market, it's a big market. And any, it's our biggest market, and improvements in access there will be helpful to the United States, and certainly improvements in access to the American market will be important for Europe. The President's going to Brussels um, in a few weeks, in the end of March. This would be an opportunity for him at a very high level with the leaders of the, of the EU to emphasize this point. But it can't be just one speech in one place. It has to be a sustained effort on his part, and Europe has to European leaders have to make that point, but also he has to understand that if he wants to make a success out of this, he has to commit himself not just to make a speech, but to take major action. And uh, that's something that has not yet been forthcoming, sadly, but it has to be. Second point is, let's use the European summits, which really have been hollow gestures in the past. This is the first time the president, this president has been to Brussels. Um, these European summits last an hour, an hour and a half. If we're serious about U.S.-European relations, then make these summits something uh, substantial. And the trade and investment area is one, but the other is what Francois and I very much agree on, and that is energy. We have the International Energy Agency, which we ought to raise the visibility of for a variety of reasons. But the U.S. and Europe, and I agree, it's not just for reasons related to Russia, although that's a wake-up call of, of, to recognize over-dependence. But it's other countries on which Europe depends who are not the most reliable sources either. And uh, therefore, it seems to me, if there were a moment in history where we emphasize with Europeans at high level, at summit level, heads of state, heads of government level, uh, energy, this is the moment. This is the moment to look at this as not just a technical issue, but a strategic issue which involves American production and export policy, European production policies, which have really been neglected in some countries or at least de-emphasized, and ways of channeling energy from more places around the world or diversifying energy sources that go to Europe and the types of fuel that go to Europe so that it is not so heavily dependent on a very few sources. These, this is an historic strategic moment in the area of trade and investment for TTIP and energy in terms of a broader strategic cooperation between the U.S. and Europe in the energy area. And I think if that's why I say Ukraine can be a wake-up call to wake us up on both sides of the Atlantic, the fact that these are important issues, they need high level attention, and they need urgent attention. If we don't do it, Europe and the U.S. economically will suffer, but so will the alliance. Bob, thank you very much. Let me begin by saying thank you, Professor Wood, for getting us in our frame of mind. I think Alexander Hamilton may have blushed a little bit at, the, at our conversation, but he would have appreciated the rigorous debate. Thank you so much to our three panelists. You have given us a great kickoff here, and I can't wait to uh, continue the conversation. So please join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you.